In what can be the busiest time of the year and sometimes the most stressful, I am thrilled that the timing has just aligned perfectly, that it is in this episode, I'm talking with my friend Meredith Edwards from Mana Nutrition, all about reducing stress so that our central nervous system and I guess our stress management system is well supported. Meredith is a clinical nutritionist. She's also an iRest teacher, which you'll hear more about as we get going, and a restorative trauma-sensitive yoga teacher. Meredith and I met through our friend Sharon Wilford, who you might remember from a previous episode. And Meredith used to, in fact, be Lee and my personal trainer, which we have a bit of a chat about the irony of that in the episode too. These days, Meredith is found mostly working with the Australian Defence Force, and she's got a real heartfelt mission to support Defence Force members, veterans and their families with lots of evidence-based tools and strategies to help them thrive amongst the challenges that they experience in personal and military life. Meredith comes from a family with very deep roots in the Australian Defence Forces, and she herself is actually a defence spouse and has had many other members of her family in the Defence Forces as well, including her brother Jonathan, who was really tragically killed a number of years ago as a Navy Sea King pilot in a helicopter crash. Meredith is no stranger to stress and trauma, and I think much of her passion to see people manage stress and trauma well comes out of her own life experience. And I guess then she brings that real compassion, which no doubt you'll hear that even just in the way she speaks. I love Meredith and all that she brings to the health and wellness space. She's an amazing cook, personal trainer, friend, yoga instructor, not to mention clinical nutritionist. So if you're wanting to touch base with Meredith and connect with her, you can do that through her website, which is Mana Nutrition, M-A-N-A, nutrition.com.au. I'll put the link to her website and the other websites that we refer to in the conversation in the show notes, so be sure to check them out. Now, before we get into the interview, I want to say a big thank you for all your support throughout the year, for listening to the podcast, for sharing, for interacting in the Let's Talk Thyroid community on Facebook. And for those that have supported me financially, I really, truly appreciate that, whether that's you did the Kickstart to Thyroid Wellness Challenge, which again will come up in February. So if you missed out, you haven't missed out. Maybe you've bought my cookbook, you've bought some essential oils from me. A huge thank you because that does help me to be able to do this and bring the positive and practical message for Thyroid Hope to everybody out there. If you have loved the podcast, I've actually now put a donate button on my on the podcast page of my website. So if you feel like you'd like to contribute to the podcast and me in that way, then please feel free to do so. Now we're about to start the interview with Meredith. At the end of this, we're finishing the episode with a short meditation. So there's none of my usual little adverts or thank you messages at the end. So I'm just going to have a general disclaimer now that anything that Meredith And I say is said in a general sense, it's not designed to be specific medical advice. So always get the advice from your health professionals. Welcome to Let's Talk Thyroid, where we explore different aspects of living a healthy thyroid lifestyle, positively and practically, to help you thrive and not just survive. Join me, Annabelle Bateman, your host, and Let's Talk Thyroid. Well, welcome, Meredith, to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. Thanks, Annabelle. It's great to be here. We finally got here. We did. We've had a few little, we've taken a little bit to get here, but that's okay. That's life anyway. And obviously, this is the perfect time in the lead up to Christmas to be talking about winding things down while everybody else is ramping things up. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, Annabelle. So yeah, the timing is perfect. I think it's always perfect. Meredith, I love, you know, I've wanted to have you on the podcast since I first started it uh, because I just love you and all of what you bring to the health Mm. and wellness space. And for those that don't know, Meredith and I go back a fair way now. (laughs) And mostly it relates to um, most of our shared experiences have not been 
calm and relaxing. They've been much more <laughs> intense. <laughs> Meredith used to be um, our personal trainer that would come to our house at five o'clock in the morning and send us running up and down the street and pounding things out on the driveway and really not very calming at all. <laughs> no, it was the opposite. It was the absolute opposite, wasn't it? Yes, high-intensity interval training. Yep, it was. And, you know, that was good for the time. Um, but it's it's really interesting that we've, you know, in some of our conversations more recently, it really has come full circle. And I've done some of your online meditations, and we're going to talk about that a bit more. But it's been really nice, I guess, to experience that full, the full range of the high intensity and the low intensity. Yes, it's the left and right of arc, really, isn't it? And Lee made that comment at the first meditation that he came to that it was the polar opposite of what we'd experienced together doing the exercise training and I think that you and I learnt so much from that about the effects of high intensity interval training on health and how you know it's really dose dependent in that it you know some some is good a lot is potentially not good and moving down you know the journey of life we come to the meditation which is the sometimes the missing piece in the in the health journey for people yeah so let's go back to the high intensity things for a minute because I think you know most people that are listening to this have some sort of thyroid issue uh, both hyper and hypo um, seems to be you know there is a mix of people you know listening at that, that range and I know often, at least with people with hypo or Hashimoto's, or certainly this has been my experience historically, is that because metabolism is slow, weight seems to be very easy to gain and next to impossible to lose, the natural inclination is that we've got to eat less, exercise more, exercise harder, slog our guts out. This was certainly how I operated for a good probably 20 years of if I'm not sweating, Mm. if I'm not nearly vomiting, if I'm not sore the next day, then I've wasted my time. Mm -hmm. So I know now that that's not right. And I know that I have done a lot of, that yeah, probably did a lot of damage to my system in doing that for a long time. And I don't do that now, but Mm. tell me from your perspective, um, what's your view on that thyroid picture, high intensity, should we do it at all? Should we do it, you know, is it case by case? I'd love to know what your thoughts are on that. A word that I use a lot is that it depends. Of course. It depends on, yeah. yeah, it depends on the person and probably where they're at in their, you know, if we're specifically talking about thyroid uh, health um, and hypothyroid and Hashimoto's, it potentially depends on where they are in their journey. Um, when you and I were training together or when I was training you, I wasn't doing much except standing there telling you what to do. Um, I think, you know, potentially we both lacked a bit of understanding around that because it seems logical, doesn't it, with, with, with that at the time. So you move forward, you become more knowledgeable and then you're able to do better. And we know that um, too much high-intensity interval training can be really stressful to the nervous system and keep a person's body that is already stressed in that stress state which we know that over time can do a lot of damage to the immune system to the endocrine system to the nervous system and really to be it's not healthy so I've read anecdotal evidence about some people that have got their Hashimoto's very under control and short bouts like I'm just meaning a few minutes four to five minutes, short bouts of high interval intensity training as a part of their whole regime that includes diet and relaxation techniques and other lifestyle things like sleep, medication, da, 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 et cetera, um, keeps them feeling really well. But this may not be suitable for the, for the next person. So it really just depends on the individual. Um, there are some people that wouldn't touch HIIT training, as it's known, with a barge pole. And that's fine because there's so many other ways to move your body. It's not the only one, not for everyone. Or not for everyone all all of the time or at every stage, I suppose, is what you're saying. Yeah, Yeah. that's right. And I guess that's where if you're working with a personal trainer or someone that's 
probably important for them to have a bit of an understanding of your your personal health and not just assume that the gym's 30-day challenge is going to be right for you. That's right because it's really about keeping a person feeling really well and we know that with um, Hashimoto's that, you know, and that autoimmune picture, it doesn't really matter what autoimmune condition that you have, it's really important to keep the uh, nervous system in a balanced state you know we will have periods of exertion whether that be in life or whether that be you know physically or mentally or or whatever but we want to bring that that um, nervous system back into balance so that the immune system and the endocrine system are not um, hammered I guess aggravated yeah and so can you let's talk about the nervous system for a little bit so we've got my understanding was we have a, a sympath- sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Is that right? Or is there more to it than that? There is a little bit more to it than that. But for brevity, I think it's good to just talk about those two arms that um, sit underneath the autonomic nervous system where there are some things um, in our control and other things that happen all by themselves, like breathing. That's a really good example of the breathing happens all by itself. We go about our day, the body breathes itself, but we can use the breath as a regulatory tool to bring about relaxation. So it's under our control as well. So if we have the autonomic system, the ANS, autonomic nervous system sitting at the top, under that is the sympathetic nervous system or fight and flight as most people know it. And then the parasympathetic nervous system, which is colloquially known as rest and digest and repair, I guess. I'm hesitant to say normal, but let's just use the word normal. Under normal circumstances, there's a really lovely reciprocity between the two arms of the nervous system. We can go into fight and flight or that drive if there is a threat or a perceived threat or we've really got to, you know, get stuff done. We're very busy in life. If we sort of go back to, you know, that hunter-gatherer example that's used a lot, it's you know, fighting the tiger or being chased by the tiger. Our nervous system perceives a threat and it mobilises our biochemistry to attend to that. And while that's happening, uh, bodily functions that are deemed unnecessary in that state, like digestion, like um, reproduction, all of those things, they're kind of, you know, put to the side by the nervous system. Don't need to be doing that right now because we're busy fighting the tiger. But when that threat is over this balance that comes back is that we return to this state of homeostasis or balance and we can rest and digest we can sit and eat a meal and not have to be frightened about the tiger or anything like that it's a reciprocal balance between the two arms of the nervous system it's probably the best way that I can explain it and in that sort of more norm, you know, what you say, it's kind of normal system, should the body fairly easy, you know, the tiger's gone, huh, we can relax now and we just get about cooking the, cooking the tiger and digesting that well and getting on with it. Totally, totally. That's exactly right. So what happens when we get stuck fighting the tiger? And I guess in our modern world is fighting the tiger getting the kids off to school and going to work and, you know, getting all the jobs done. And at this time of the year, it's all the Christmas presents and the, Chris, you know, all the family, lots of relationships that go on at Christmas and the parties. And is that, are we constantly fighting the tiger? Yes. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter if there is actually a real tiger or not. When we live in that, that, you know, um, state all of the time, that driven state all of the time, you know, this, this year has been, quite something, hasn't it? So we've got this, you know, COVID-19 pandemic on top of it, border closures, people not being able to see family. So there's an extra level. I think in the research there is more information regarding stress being a trigger for Graves' disease than there is for Hashimoto's. Um, But I wonder if that, and I have read, that it is potentially because the onset of Hashimoto's is a little bit more insidious. Uh Uh-huh. It, it's kind of a, you know, over over a long period of time. But I know we've had this conversation before where we go, yeah, there's been there's there's been a stress trigger in there somewhere. Yeah. Whether that be emotional stress, environmental stress, physical physical stress, you know, it, there's all, all different all different kinds of stress. So that's 
that's, you know, we become stuck in that arm of the of the nervous system. And I think that's a really common thing for this day and age. So if we're stuck there, what can that, I mean, aside, I guess aside from it triggering an autoimmune issue, mm-hmm. but if we already mm-hmm. know we're in that space, we are, it's already, autoimmune issue is already triggered, we're already living with it. And we're, yes, yes. And we're kind of still stuck in that space. Is there Are there other ways that it presents? Potentially a good litmus test would be, you know, your sleep might be affected, you're not sleeping well, your mood might be affected, you might notice digestive changes where, you know, you've got a little bit of bloating and, I, I you know, because you're not digesting your food properly, you know, your food might feel stuck like it's not moving through. It just, again, here it is, this word depends on the person where it's going to manifest because our society has a grind culture, this badge of busyness that we have. Sometimes we're numb to it. We don't even realise. And then you get this phenomenon of when people go on holiday, they get sick. You suddenly switch into chill mode in this parasympathetic mode and then what needs to be attended to your body just goes, right, okay, now's the time to deal with this. So that could be a good indication that you are constantly in that stress state is if when you stop you get sick, is that what you're saying? Because the immune system all of a sudden has a chance to catch up and... That's right. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's little indicators, things like poor exercise, recovery, uh, problems with your skin, it can kind of just manifest, you know, joint aches and pains, um, things like that. So... I really think that one of the opportunities that we can give ourselves is to really tap into the feedback system that our body so elegantly has built into it. But we stop listening to that because of all of the things that we need to do. And then we think, okay, well, I need to get healthy. I'm not feeling healthy, so I'm going to start exercising more. And we jump back to that cycle that we were talking about before got to do more I've got to exercise more I've got to you know it's all this output 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 and there's nothing coming back in speaking back to the grind culture that we live in to stop and rest is often seen as lazy would you agree with that you're nodding okay yeah yes. no I do yes. agree with that it's a little and bit I, lazy you know we're not achieving anything or yeah and it look it seems to me anecdotally that that there seems to be a bit of a personality trend towards mm-hmm. people that mm. seem to get autoimmune thyroid issues seem to be those that like to push themselves and maybe high achieve, overachieve. Uh, even this week uh, I was having this conversation with a friend also with Hashimoto's last week, said it would be really interesting to find out if there's a correlation with birth order. And, That's you know, fascinating. yeah, and so I've just asked in the Facebook community my you know thyroid community this week and there is a definite trend I suppose that you can can probably guess which birth order tends to come up number one (laughs) number one the trailblazer yeah number one by 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 a large I mean yes there's obviously there's a spread but very clear front runner was the eldest child and so to me that and I guess I am an eldest child I am that personality um it does seem to fit. It does with, seem, yeah. So you've got that drive, yeah, yeah, all all of the time and the push, yeah. And so if you're not doing that, you do feel lazy, and even though you've got often no energy, you still feel like you've got to push forward. Yes, yeah. Or if you don't, either you perceive that you're lazy, or think the other thing that I hear, this isn't that other people can perceive you as being lazy because they don't understand if you are resting and taking that time out because you really don't have any energy, then family or friends or bosses at work or whatever can perceive you as lazy. So Yeah, yeah I think lazy right. and, and selfish are probably two of the, the things that can kind of be attached to that. I just think that comes possibly from a lack of understanding or appreciation about restorative elements of life and you know sleep is another thing that gets cut away by people 
trying to achieve and fit a lot into the day. And we know that sleep out of any of the talk about the four switches of resilience and well-being and, you know, we've got sleep, mindfulness, exercise and nutrition. If, if I'm speaking from my professional standpoint, um, I would put sleep at the top of the list. That's priority number one because everything from there is more possible when you have had a restorative sleep and that's where the rest, digest, repair happens um, really profoundly in the body and the brain. So part of my professional quest is to have the appreciation for sleep and things like mindfulness meditation, you know, a little bit elevated in our consciousness because it's kind it's kind of like the other side of the coin or the full equation. Um, I can't remember who said this first, but it's, you know, training equals work plus rest. That's life equals work plus rest, whatever that equation is for you. And just going back to your uh, question about, you know, what happens for someone that lives with chronic unchecked stress. So, you know, I talked about those signs and symptoms, but, you know, we talked about autoimmunity happening, you know, in a person's body, but things like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, you know, they're, they're all disease hallmarks of a really stressed individual. So stress can really make you physically and mentally unwell. But I do think that more broadly as a community, we're starting to hear more about the importance of sleep and mindfulness. I agree. So I, I have noticed that, but I wonder, there's one thing to know that it's important. It's another thing to prioritise that and make them important in your own life. Yes. Yes. So if we're talking about restorative sleep, what are your tips for getting restorative sleep? How do we do that? If we're not getting good sleep or we have trouble falling asleep or we wake up in the night, how do we get good quality sleep? What are your tips for us? Beautiful. That's a great question. So if I step you through a day, so when, when we wake up in the morning, first thing is to go outside and be in the sunlight or the daylight because that will synchronise your master clock in your brain to then understand more fully the difference between light and dark because there are certain hormonal and physiological processes that are really synchronised to daytime and nighttime. So that's step one. Go outside and be in the daylight. doesn't matter if it's cloudy or sunny, so do that. Is there a length of time? Like should we be there for a couple of minutes, half an hour? Oh, I think, I think I'm just going to say whatever you can get is better than nothing because we really are modern day cave dwellers. If we get up and then we, you know, we're in artificial lighting, then we go to work, artificial lighting, don't get outside. You know, we really don't get the hours of daylight that we really need to be healthy. So I sort of say whatever you can get, unless you're a shift worker. So that's a whole other conversation. So we want that synchronizing of the master clock in the brain with the sunlight I've read it called daylight anchoring if you just want a colloquial term to use daylight anchoring so you're going to anchor your master clock to the sun if you're a coffee drinker um, you want to keep that again a minimal dose and before noon Um, some of your listeners probably or may not drink coffee at all because it is essentially not healthful for someone with Hashimoto's but you know, when you do that sort of reintroduction of your diet, you may, because I know you enjoy. Yeah, I a still nice have my coffee. coffee, but I can't have it. Yeah, it's definitely one one a day, and for me, really, ideally, it's probably even before eleven. That would be Amazing. my absolute yes. cut off. Is then I can't sleep. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. So you're aware of that in yourself already. So that's you know manage where your caffeine sits in the day. Nothing afternoon and then so meal timing has a lot to do with affecting sleep quality so we uh, don't want to eat dinner late so dinner around sunset and if possible to have your last bite of food three to four hours before you go to bed because we really want a decent period of time for your body to finish the digestive processes so that when you go to bed it's all, it's all about the business of sleep and restorative sleep. Setting up during the evening for, you will have heard the term sleep hygiene. Yep. So making sure that I know, Annabelle, you do your blue light blocking glasses. That's a really big one. Yeah, I do when I remember. Let's just yeah. say I have them. Yeah. I have a few pairs actually. Them. Yeah, You have them. Yeah. That's a 
that's the first step. I have seen you in them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. And if you wear glasses like me, um, my glasses in the normal lens just have a blue light blocking filter. Making sure that screens, TVs, laptops, computers, phones, um, that you're pretty much done with them at least an hour before bed because that blue light that we get from the screens blocks melatonin, which is required for sleep. It's our nighttime hormone. It's a powerful antioxidant, so we don't want to do anything that's going to block that. Um, And if you have trouble sleeping, maybe coming up with a really nice bedtime ritual, you know, warm shower, a bath, some meditation, anything that's going to help you relax and then keeping a regular bedtime schedule because your body likes routine, the body and the brain like routine. So going to bed at the same time every night, getting up at the same time um, in the morning and aiming for seven to nine hours of sleep. So women need a little bit more, about an hour. And, you know, kind of sticking to that schedule is uh, a great thing to do for sleep. Yeah. And if it's if it's not appearing to be fixable by those strategies, then you can, you know, look to engage a health professional or a doctor to maybe fix that because it's, yeah, it's important. And I'm not sure what your sleep like is like or, you know, um, if it's impacted with Hashimoto's a little bit more or do you notice hormonally? Yeah, that's a good good question. Yeah, I would say definitely sleep has been a challenge for me pretty much. When I look back, even as a little girl, I had trouble falling asleep. So it has been an issue on and off really my whole life. So, yeah, I have a few. I I mean, this is, yeah, maybe we have a whole conversation about sleep. But I do have a sleep routine. I, I have done, I know all the right things to do. My biggest issue with sleep and falling asleep is switching my brain off. It yes. is having that yes. ability for my brain to stop thinking and wind down. And so probably the two things that I do that I know don't fit within that, but I'm a bit too reluctant to let go of them. Um, so <laughs> is that I, I need, well, I'm going to say I need to read myself off to sleep because that's how mm. I fall asleep is I Mm -hmm. read until I fall asleep reading because then my mind is not on the day or what I'm feeling or what I should have said or shouldn't have said or what I've still got left to do from whatever I'm reading. Yes. But I read on my Kindle app on my iPad. So I know that that's a screen. Um, My justification, I suppose, is that I have it on black background, white writing on the dimmest setting that I can have and the rest of the room is dark. Whereas if I was reading a paper book with a light, it would be much brighter. So that's my kind of... It would feel brighter, yeah. That's my justification, I suppose. I haven't worked out an alternative to that yeah but right now it's working for you right now most of the time that works for me okay okay and then does your kindle have um you know how on the um on the smartphones these days you can turn it to i can't remember what it's called night mode and then on the laptops you can put download flux f dot lux dot com so it's a free download so that as the sun starts to set the screens automatically turn from, you know, bright and that blue light to an amber light. Yeah, the iPad does have a night setting. My phone has a night setting. So does the computer. I don't tend to be on the computer at night as a general rule. So, yeah, I do have some of those. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes I'm wearing the blue blocking glasses as well. Yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah, but the thinking mind is often a reason why it's hard to initiate sleep. So that's, so yeah, maybe we do come back and have a full conversation about Mm. sleep, but to getting that restorative sleep is really important to that rest and digest and letting all of that. It's the chief nourisher of all longevity systems in the body. Everything, everything is restored. But there's the knowledge and the action 
So I think, yeah. I mean, even to me, there is still some level of gap. I know I've got to get out first thing in the morning, get some sunlight. Do I do it every day? No. So there's that knowing and doing are two different things. And sometimes I find for me, because I know, I don't know everything by any stretch, but I know a lot of these things, I can feel like I'm doing them even though I'm not actually doing them because I know that I should be doing them. Does that make sense? I know exactly what you mean, what you mean. Yes. And I can be the same. I think when we're in that, you know, we, we live a life where the whole conversation and work is around health and you can have this knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that you have the application or that you're consistent with the application of those things. So yeah, I can relate. Yeah, we're all works in progress. None of us have got this perfectly <laughs> yeah, done that's path. Right. Maybe that's what makes us real and people can go. At progress, not perfection. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so so while we before we get right into the meditation side, um, I just want to ask, I mean, you are a nutritionist uh, and amongst yeah. your many, many skills and talents and qualifications. Are there any particular foods that are really bad for the that stress, the central, you know, your the nervous system, are there any that we really should make sure we do include in our diet? Oh, um, I can broad brushstroke. Yeah, broad broad brushstroke. Um, I would say things that are processed with food chemicals and food additives um, are definitely going to stress uh, stress the body. Food intolerances, so there's, you know, that word depends, again, one food that might um, suit me might not suit you and vice versa and that can cause a lot of stress on the body you know from the obviously the digestive system and then the immune system uh, because your body has to mount an, a, a response against it so eating even perceived healthy foods for some people can be difficult because they have an intolerance to it so around that you know that Hashimoto's conversation you know gluten is uh, an aggravating factor nightshade I don't know if nightshades for you are but there are a few food yeah few food groups that um healthy to some people but but not to others but I would definitely say that foods that we're not designed to eat like highly processed franken foods or whatever you want to call them that are filled with food chemicals and additives and preservatives they're really um eaten consistently over time is going to cause a body stress and it will impact sleep behavior mood all yeah. that and are, and are there any foods that are calming for our stress levels our nervous system mm. there's a lot of research um around saffron Ooh, interestingly okay. that just mm. popped into my mind saffron and um calming the nervous system anything that really reduces inflammation is quite calming uh turmeric and ginger I really think that if you are eating a, you know, an unprocessed diet, it can be quite calming because you're naturally reducing inflammation. You're naturally providing the body with nutrients that it needs to make brain chemicals and hormones. So your body that then comes back into that into that balance. Um, but it's also the environment in which you eat. You could be eating something very healthy in a stressful environment, you know, racing in your car to the next meeting or, you know, and, you, and you, yeah, so it's it's a balance between what you're eating and how you're eating it perhaps. Why don't we, ch- why don't we talk now about the meditation? So we've talked about this, you know, sleep, sure. mindfulness, and this is something that I know you're really passionate about now and you work with uh, many of our amazing people in the Defence Force and, uh, yes. and helping them to unwind and maybe deal with some of traumas, past traumas. Tell us a bit about, you know, mindfulness, meditation. I'm just going to hand over to you and let you take us where you want to take us in terms of the conversation. And then we're going to, uh, just as a heads up, if you're listening, we're going to end with a short meditate guided meditation and that will see out the end of the podcast with no music or you know me talking again at the end it'll just fade out into this beautiful relaxing meditation at the end have three minutes of relaxing together yeah that's great I think that um the mindfulness meditation or just mindfulness let's talk to that first there's informal 
and formal, I guess, if I just break it up into sort of two segments. Informal mindfulness is just a mindful way of living. So if we define mindfulness, I probably won't do it justice, but it's about living in the present moment, being in the present moment and appreciating what's there, being content with what is and moving through your daily life mindfully. So noticing and appreciating what's there uh, without judging it, being being in a state of uh, awareness and being able to move your attention within that. And then um, you can apply that to anything. You can apply that to the way you eat, the way you interact with people during the day. One of the first, I guess, domestic mindfulness tasks that I was given way back by uh, an acupuncturist actually that I was seeing when I was learning about mindfulness and meditation was ironing. So that's one of the most. You told me this when we were caught up recently. Well, that's right. And it, you know, if for people that find it difficult to sit down and meditate, okay, I've got to sit here and meditate and clear my mind of thoughts. And, you know, it's, it's not that at all. So yeah, this acupuncturist, he said, Practice this when you're ironing. So you're watching the iron move over the clothes, noticing the tip of the iron, come uh, sort of come in contact with the wrinkles in the clothes, and then you're noticing the wrinkles, and then you look to where the iron has been, and you notice the smoothness. This is years and years ago, but it's something that has stuck in my mind. It's you're going to iron potentially. There are some people that don't iron but you're potentially going to iron a piece of clothing and that's a mindful way of doing it, noticing rather than thinking about all of these other things that you should be doing or you're going to be doing. You're in the present moment with whatever you're doing. Um, On the Air Force programs that I work on, we do an exercise of mindful eating and I give everybody a lint ball, (laughs) kids, grown-ups included, because we, we have family programs as well. And I guide them through a mindfulness eating exercise. And to my knowledge, well, I have never come across anyone, including myself, that would eat a chocolate that slowly, but it's really all about noticing every tiny little detail about this particular chocolate that you're going to eat. Well, maybe we've got to do that one on the next the, podcast too. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we maybe we have to do that one. But you can you can sort of, you know, once you've done the exercise, you go, wow. How did that change my experience with what I just ate? And how could I apply that, you know, in in other areas of my life? Because when you're in that present moment, perhaps your, you know, creative thinking and problem solving is more enhanced. The way you interact and listen with people enhances your relationship. So that's the informal side of things, moving through your daily life mindfully. That's very good for the nervous system to do that because it takes away that sense of hurry and rush that is always there that is really quite stimulatory to the to the nervous system and then you have formal mindfulness practices so this is where you might go to a um, meditation class you might have an app on your phone that you will listen to a guided meditation of some kind Um, it can be prayer it can be just sitting and noticing your breathing but you've consciously chosen to sit there and and practice something that brings your body and your mind into a state of stillness there are so many different types of meditation and it's just finding the one that fits for you Uh, for me personally the one that I fell in love with and has been very sustaining for me and that I am delighted to share is I rest which stands for integrative restoration. And it's a modernised form of yoga nidra, which is a very ancient yogic practice of meditation, which is, if I can feel like my explanations may not do it justice, but it's uh, defined as yogic sleep, but it's being in a state of relaxation where you're not fully conscious and awake in, you know, in your wide awake state of mind and body and you're not asleep in bed practicing body sensing breath sensing and in eye rest proactively choosing to engage in uh, whatever thoughts beliefs are arising so that you can really your mind your breath and learn so much more about yourself and the way you respond to life I guess so 
yeah, that's that's kind of where where I've found myself as an IRS teacher. And um, for me personally, it's been life and health changing. In what way? How has it improved your life and health? For me personally, I guess um, I, I did share with you in, in my bio, so happy to, if you think it's appropriate for your audience, I came across meditation after my brother Jonathan was killed, who was a Navy seeking pilot. And, um, you know, this is a, a very tiny sound bite out of a, a, a big part of uh, my life and out of my family. But I was seeing a psychologist after that and I had not practiced meditation or mindfulness before. In fact, I was the girl who would leave a yoga class when the relaxation would happen at the end because I was too busy. So, you know, you never need a resilience skill until you really need it. So this psychologist taught me to essentially do breath sensing and use my breath as a self-regulatory tool. And it kind of just went from there over a long period of time. And then I uh, became a trauma-sensitive yoga teacher and then I did my eye rest training and the eye rest stuck for me or resonated for me because it's an easy to follow map. It is uh, essentially a safe and an easy map to follow to go through a meditative practice, starting with initial relaxation, setting an intention, understanding and tapping into your inner resources, which are comprised of your breath and your strength at your centre and your essential nature, essentially, and developing an attunement to the felt sense of well-being that is always in your body, but it gets covered up and forgotten by the busyness of life and all of the things that happen to us and around us and, and within us. And then to go through the body sensing, which is rotating attention around the body. So it's usually guided or rotation of attention throughout the body. So you start with your jaw and then it uses the sensory and motor cortex in the brain. And essentially what that means is that you're using the mind or the brain to relax the body and using the body to calm the mind. Um, so there's a lot of neuroscience research around that, which is really fascinating. Um, and then breath sensing, of course, so you're realising that your breath is a really beautiful tool or a gift. I think it's a gift more than, more than just a tool. It's a beautiful gift that we have to uh, calm our nervous system and really deepen our attunement to this feedback system. You know, we, our, our breath is always telling us something. If we're aware of our breath and we're in this situation and the breath is really short and shallow, that's telling you something. Am I anxious here? Am I anxious in this environment? Um, is there something that I can do to calm my calm my breathing, calm my body? Um, and then, you know, deep, beautiful, relaxed breathing speaks to your nervous system to say it's safe to relax. And then you go into that arm, um, you activate that parasympathetic nervous system in the body. If people are listening and they're kind of intrigued about IRS, how can mm. they find out more or access iris meditations how 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 do people kind of tap into that yeah great question so the irest institute it's an american uh website the institute is from the u.s because irest actually has its service and support of the u.s military so uh dr richard miller a clinical psychologist uh and irest meditation teacherized it so that it was relevant and accessible to um u.s military serving members and it was initially used in the treatment and recovery of returning since 2010 it has been uh, endorsed by the u.s army surgeon general and it's used for as a tier one uh, approach for pain management so it can be applied not just for trauma recovery for pain management for stress for for really anything it's been used in addictions so it's it's for all people, all cultures, all faiths. It's it's completely accessible, and it just has been put into a very logical framework of this is how we follow the map. So even though it's normally done in a guided way, 
guided meditations that you can listen to, some for sleep, some for anxiety. That's completely accessible there. Um, I have three free downloadable audio recordings on my website that people can download onto a device and listen to at any time. Excellent. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. Yeah, great. And I'll link to the um, the iREST Institute. So you're saying you've got some and then the iREST Institute website would have some others as well? Yeah. Yes. And I know on Spotify there will be some, uh, if you did a search on Spotify for iREST, it may come up with some suggestions there. Cool. Excellent. And are they short, longer, like are they kind of variety in length because I know the ones that I've guided ones I've done with you have been fairly long are they are they all like that or are they different the ones on the iREST website um can be uh anywhere from eight minutes up to about 20 minutes okay oh, and not too long. Yeah. the ones on my website I have no, it's not too long. Um, in fact, the, the ones on my website, I've got two 20-minute ones and a 35-minute one. Um, I have intention to do some shorter ones just so that they can be like a little power break during the day and then, and then one for sleep. So with IRES, the research that has been done into that, um, in the States, eight minutes of IRES is akin to a power nap and the benefits of that are just increasing energy focus and concentration reducing that sense of fatigue Um, I've spoken to an ICU nurse before that she takes on her break she'll just go and do a short eye rest practice to just elevate her level of energy for the rest of her shift and she said that it also has really um, helped her deepen her sense of empathy and compassion for patients elevates and Brighton's mood, um, it's been shown to increase physical performance as well. And then when we get into the longer practices up to about 35 minutes, that's when we're going to the deeper work of improved immunity and tissue repair, uh, improved brain function and memory, um, improved sleep quality um, and reducing those stress hormones and improving overall hormonal balance in the endocrine system. Wow. So it's really powerful. It doesn't yeah, look like that, you're doing yeah. very much. But you are. So that's a, that's but really you kind of really are. really, isn't it? It it has that therapy it's therapeutic. It is absolutely medicinal. Yeah. So you could legitimately use that as part of your therapy. Absolutely. Thyroid health absolutely. treatment in that sense. Yes. Yes. And I um I do take these classes, uh I take two guided IRS classes every week out at Rath Base Williamtown. And I got some feedback from one of the ladies who uh, is one of the regulars and she accidentally came to my class. She thought she was going to a regular yoga class. She got so much more. It was very funny because she wrote to me and said, I I really thought I was walking into this ordinary yoga class, but then I realised it was very different. And so she kept coming and what she shared with me was that she had had a very complex health condition for over a decade. She'd had something like 18 surgeries. Uh, She had had so much time off work. She'd really lost all semblance of health and herself. And the practice of eye rest, she has attributed this practice of eye rest to returning to the best run of health that she had had since 2011. Wow. She's been able to return to work, but most importantly, she has said a return to me. And that was the most beautiful thing, that she had really discovered the benefits of making the eye rest uh, practice a part of her day. So integrative restoration is is the extended version of eye rest. So, so she integrated, really integrated into her day. Yeah. She, really, she really had integrated this into her day and she was able to return to work. She uses the practice of eye rest when she's going in for medical appointments that can be quite uncomfortable or painful and even her doctors and surgeons have remarked about that and she's shared with them that her her ability to focus on her breath and give this sustained attention to this felt sense of well-being has really been a game changer for her so I you know I've, I've had feedback like that from people who have felt the benefits of the IRS practice, which I, I, you know, I mean, I can tell you about how I've benefited from it, but when you share it with others, it's really quite something. It's really beautiful. Hmm. 
before we lead into doing, you know, the short uh, meditation, if people wanted to connect with you, follow what you're doing, uh, yes. can they yes. book an appointment with you if they wanted one? Like how to, or where should yes. we send people to to connect with you? My website would probably be a great place to start. Yes, it can definitely um, message me through Instagram if they like. I, I really love taking people through iRest as a bit of a journey. I have clients that book in with me just to do iRest and learn learn about the 10 steps. That's probably something I didn't say before. There are 10 steps in this map of iRest. And I have a workbook that's available for people to email to them that may give them some more information, but they can contact me through the the contact form on my website, reach out. I'd love to have a conversation to see if it was something that suited them that would benefit their their health and wellbeing. So, yeah, if you're listening and this sort of resonates, do connect with Meredith because I know with thyroid one of the common triggers is trauma. You know, I know that, you know, that stress trauma can be one of, you know, the, obviously a whole range of different things, but dealing with that, that trauma, the underlying emotional stress is really important. And that's right up your alley. You know, you've been through trauma, yeah. you understand it, you're working with servicemen and women who, you know, are living with trauma of different kinds as well. So if that's, I guess I would say, if you're listening and this is you and you feel like you've so you've had trauma or you're going through trauma or even if you had a traumatic experience as a child, this perhaps this is something that you could explore. And I've got to tell you that Meredith is such a kind, beautiful soul and so gorgeous to work with that you would do well to spend some time with her because you, you restore my soul when I when I talk to you so (laughs) so we're gonna I'm gonna leave it to you to guide us through uh, some meditation Mm. if people are listening to this driving is it something they can do or should they switch it off and do it later (laughs) like I'm mindful that people listen to podcasts in all different kind of forums so I don't want to call it be you know cause of any um Absolutely. I guess if you're driving the car, you can just kind of obviously, well, you're obviously going to keep your eyes open. You could just listen to it to see if, you know, it would be something that you would like to then consciously choose to set aside some time to be still to do it. I thought today that this is not a traditional eye rest practice that we're going to do. This is actually a loving kindness meditation. This is a really beautiful one to share in touch with the the felt sense of love in your body, which feels really nice. It's actually very good for you, good for your nervous system. And then because it's a loving kindness meditation, we'll be we'll be doing that for ourselves, but for those we love. And I think circling back to what you said at the beginning, this time of year, sharing time. So um, I hope you enjoy this. So it's three minutes as my teacher says about letting this practice of mindfulness grow in your life in whatever way that is for you so that little drops of peace become a pond and then a lake and then an ocean and this ability is inside all of us and I think that's a really beautiful thing to remember that we have the ability to be still and be calm and tap into that wellspring of life and well-being that's within us. So let's begin. So you can choose to have your eyes closed or gently open. It's up to you. And then just give yourself permission to rest and allow your body to soften and settle into the surface that's providing you with support. Noticing the natural weight of the body. And then turn your easy attention to your breath. Welcoming connection with your breath. Perhaps noticing the touch of your breath on your nostrils and top lip. And then 
noticing your body breathing itself without you, the doer, as you rest here, as you take a little pause to practice this loving kindness meditation together, welcoming connection with those sharing the practice, welcoming connection, and then call to mind the people in your life that you love and notice the effects that this has on your body and mind. Noticing sensations in your body as you call to mind the people in your life that you love. Then... Let my voice be your voice as you repeat these words after me in your mind and heart. May they be filled with loving kindness. May they be safe from inner and outer dangers. May they be well in body and mind. May they be happy and at ease. And then now let's take a few moments to say these words to ourselves and fully Immerse yourself here in the felt sense of well-being that these words of kindness and compassion bring. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be well in body and mind. May I be happy and at ease. And when it feels complete for you, aware to the present moment, aware of sensations of well-being, Gently opening your eyes and noticing how you feel now. Thank you for sharing the practice with me.